to the 2018 UBS Philanthropy Conference. Just in case you thought Robin tricked you into attending a UBS event, don't worry. But I thought uh, I wanted to show this to give you a glimpse of how this tonight's event evolved. Right? So UBS organizes a philanthropy forum every year, sometimes in Singapore, sometimes in Hong Kong. And this year, uh, we invited Hannes and of course Robin to attend the conference. And this is how we match with the two of them. And uh, the philanthropy conference is one of my most favorite event in uh, UBS because it's really focusing on how to inspire people to give back and to do good. And it couldn't be a better example to have Robin here that's orchestrating the whole event tonight to, to put forth what he has learned and to share it with the rest of you. Of course, with Woo! Oh, thank you, UBS. The introduction will be short because I know everyone uh, was very patiently waiting. Uh, you can, yes, thank you everyone for your patience. So I first met Hannes uh, two months ago at the UBS conference, and uh, you can see it was uh, very more like a quite formal, quite structured kind of way of doing things. And then we also can see the other way of how humanitarian work, and that's where I think Hannes will share of all his adventures and stories. But I'm not going to spoil the show. I'm just going to take this time to thank a few people. First of all, I'd like to thank Sumin for really uh, sponsoring the venue and helping us and uh, providing this great space uh, in UBS. Um, I didn't organize this alone, Colin as well. Uh, we just came back from Cambodia and visited uh, Hannes' project in Phnom Penh. So Colin and I uh, said, okay, we have to do something. And then I think in five days, we managed to get so many people interested. And thank you all for taking the time to come today. Um, there are also many who offered their venues. Um, I know Winnie did and uh, uh, ECN did and all that. So thank you for offering your venues and uh, your hospitalities are very much appreciated. Thank you, Pauline, for the catering. Thank you, Claire, for the kuei. Thank you, Pauline, for the wine. Um, thanks, um, Diana, for the oysters. I paid for it, but uh, she let me do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, thank you, Hannes, for actually spending time to to come here to agree to speak when actually he has a very packed schedule speaking channel news this morning and also as the VIP speaker for the honor symposium which is happening today and tomorrow. So I also like to thank my team at RPRE for my uh, and we have uh, Tatian and Luke and Jamie and who's helped uh, organize all this as well. So thank you all for helping and Daryl of course being the chauffeur and driver. Thank you. So um, without further ado, I just want to leave you to this uh, great storyteller of Hannes and uh, he has a wonderful, just enjoy the ride. Hannes, everyone. Okay, I'm an artist. And I uh, have a very interesting life, of course, and I'd like to introduce myself with a very little clip, a little video, so that you understand a little bit more who I am. Each photo tells a unique story. And each story becomes a stunning photo. Eine Geschichte zu erleben war mir nicht gut. Ich musste sie leben. Realität zu inszenieren, das war mein Ziel. Hannes Schmidt takes us to the most exciting locations in the world, where other photographers reach their limits. He goes a step further to create images that have left their mark on the memory of entire generations. Treat your eyes to an amazing journey. Years ago, I uh, was uh, one of my artworks was in Thailand, and in the evening, uh, on the way to the restaurant, I had to cross a bridge. And on the bridge, there was a girl begging. She was covered with a piece of fabric. And I noticed in my pants, and I took some butter and threw it in that little metal can, and then she was just like shaken up, and the fabric flew away, and then I was shocked. I was looking in a horrifying 
destroyed face, burned. I could see the body is burned. I could see that she can't really eat, but everything was like stick together. And I was so shocked. I, I didn't expect it. So I went to the restaurant where I wanted to meet my friend for dinner. And I said to my friend, look, I, I cannot eat. I, I, I have to go. I have to go back and see what happened to this little girl. So when I went back, she was gone. So next day I was looking for her all over the place. It was in Udoltani, a small town in the northeast. And uh, while I found her again, she was leaving at the same place. And I tried to talk to her, I speak a little bit Thai, and I realized she doesn't speak Thai. And the guy came by and said, hey, sir, you don't have to speak Thai with her. She's a Cambodian, you have to speak Khmer. And by the way, she's a backing doll. They made her like this, that she makes more money. And I couldn't believe. I said, no, this is not possible. I mean, who, who would do that? So I took an interpreter, and uh, she told me her story. Her name is Wei. When she was three years old, her father from Patambang, he is a rice farmer. He was in deep debt, like mainly a lot of the rice farmers in Cambodia. So he couldn't pay the money back to the Vietnamese loan sharks. So they charged 40% interest a month. So he had nine children. So the only thing was to sell off the two youngest children, the two girls. But nobody wanted it. So he took the blowtorch and he burned them, the face, the body, the legs. And then he was able to sell them to an old woman. And the old woman took them to Thailand, where she sold them to a backing syndication. That happened when they was three years old. Ten years later, I found her on the bridge. Horrible life. Never seen a doctor. I would need to school, sexually abused by the police, put in jail again, taken out again, beaten up. And every evening on the bridge, she had to give the money to the syndication, and she was left with nothing. And it was so shocking for me, because I have two children, and I said, Mother, see, you, you cannot turn your face anymore. This is, this is it. So I was putting $500 in cash to the syndication. I took her, and I smuggled her in Poi Pet, back to Cambodia and put her in an orphanage in Phnom Penh. And uh, that's where my life changed. See, changed my life. This is way the day. She looks horrible. But this is not even what she had to go through. When I start working there with the orphanage, I've been told, well, honest, that is a lot of children. 250 to 300, we estimate. They plunge with acids, they burn their bodies, and they sell them into the begging indications in Asia. And if you want to know where they are, where they come from, you have to go to the dump site outside of Phnom Penh. And what you're going to find on the dump site is going to be worse. Next day, it went to the dump site, and it was even worse and worse what I discovered. It was horrifying. 10,000 people living there. They go, they go through this rubbish, stinky rubbish, you know, plastic bags, rotten food, rats, and that's how children live there. Toilet, they don't exist. You can do number one and number two in your house because it doesn't matter when the rain comes, everything is washed away. Families with four kids, five kids, they work the whole day when the sun go up and when the sun go down. They are with a big metal hook, take out that bottles, plastic, metal, and they sell it later on to these Vietnamese and Chinese people. It's a night of recycling. They don't have shoes. Horrible life by 40 degrees. And uh, they get injuries, they have nothing. Uh, they have no water. Um, a lot of them are very sick. But around the dump side, there is little businesses. Because they need the big bags where they can put in the pet bottle. And uh, there are families, maybe 60, 70 families, and they collect cement bags, chemical bags, and that's where they sew together these bigger bags. This is horrifying what happened there. Die after less than a year, lung infection, they spit blood. The mother is happy if she makes it a year so Usually, the families, they die very quickly. Because of the lung infections, because they live, they breathe, they eat, 
in this chemical substance. It's horrifying. But today is a bit of a problem, you know, because the big corporations, the hotel, they do their own recycling. So there is less, less recycling material ending up on the dump site. There is more rotten food, so actually that's good because they can tear off this plastic bag and they can search for edibles. But there's a dark side to it. They have no recycling anymore, but they have children. Child prostitution. If you look at this girl, she has the sexual disease in her mouth. She's eight years old. We have over 6,000 girls in the age of 5 to 12 in the child prostitution. 25 cents they get for a blowjob. This is standard. Five blowjobs, a kilo of rice. Three blowjobs, no rice. They get beaten up. But that's not the end of it. This is the beginning. Because when you are 11, 12 years old, they've been sold for sex. $1,000 is the standing rate for a workshop. After the first time, they stitch them up. Sell them for $500 as a second and $250 for a third. And after that, well, $2.50, $3 lucky if they get it. And you can do with them whatever you want. Nobody is asked. The police is making money, they make, everybody is making money, they make. and it's really crazy. This is a five year old girl. Her mother paints her lips every day so that she sticks out, but she's very ill. She has a heartworn disease, you can see it on the belly. But usually when you take, talk to these little girls, I, very often, because I live there, they're my neighbors, uh, they say, yeah, the worst is they have to swallow all these things, what they are put in their mouths, and if they don't swallow it, then they get beaten up. And this is horrifying, what happened in Cambodia, every day, every day. When they turn 14, 15, 16, they get pregnant. But this is very bad, because these girls, know that they don't have enough and these babies, they can hardly survive, right? Uh, because there is no uh, milk powder. They don't have milk powder. They, they don't have clean water. Uh, uh, their mother milk is contaminated, you know, because they're sick. They have disabilities, they have malaria, they have hyperid, they have sexual disease. And the only way you get out of that is when somebody turns 17, 18, they go and work in the textile factories for 11 to 14 cents an hour, or 40, 50 dollars a month, lucky. Well, the government has set the standard salary of 120, but nobody gets 120. And this is really very, very, very slavery bad. We have around where I have my uh, organization of 500,000 women in the garment production. And this is how it looks like. That's how they get transported, 120, 150 women on a truck. Hundreds of trucks, hundreds, every morning at 7 o'clock. Factories with about 7,000 square meters hosting 13 to 15,000 women. There is no toilets, there is no ventilation, there is nothing there. When you're in there, you work, you get money, when you're sick, or when you are getting heat strokes because it's so hot in the, in the, in the hot season, and you've just been dumped in front of the factory. You produce the Hennessy Maurits, uh, Gucci, Prada, Armani, Adidas, Puma, all the big brands. This is outsourcing. The brands say they don't know because they have a contract with a Chinese or a Vietnamese or a Thai producer. But they don't produce in Thailand, China, or in Vietnam. They bring it in trucks, sealed under the control of the police and the army to Cambodia where they produce the clothes. I know which kind of clothes because I find part of it on the dump side later on. And this is a disaster what happened there. Bangladesh is outsourcing in Cambodia. Bangladesh outsourcing. It's heartbreaking. But what happened? As you see, nearly 50% of these women on the average, 80% have a heartworm disease. 50 to maybe $60, $40. They have to pay $10 for the bed they share with another woman. And the rest they should eat, but they cannot eat because they have to send the money home. That's what they did. They have a family, eight, ten, maybe more people who have to, they wait for the money being shipped home every month. So they, on the nourished, 
In Cambodia, we have an average life expectation of 52 to 56 years. 80% of the Cambodian die on diabetes. Rice, because 90% of their diet, their diet is rice. Rice is starch and sugar. So, what happened to these young women? They marry when you have such a short life expectation. By the way, it's 90% of forced marriage for women. The tag, price tag, is between $5,000 and $5,600. That's what we pay in Cambodia for a wife. But they get pregnant very quickly. This child who's going to be born because that is an undernourished uterus is small growing and they are the brain up to 20% less developed. We're talking about millions of children being born in the next 10, 15 years, and they will have no chance with a very bad education system like Cambodia to make any progress. Now is the season of rain, typhoid, you know, very bad. These people had no money to buy gas to cook, so they use wood, the wood is wet. But there is also not much you can really cook, so we slow the dogs, right? Mouses, whatever we find to put in the soup, to have something in the soup. And in the slums, the boys, they are very creative because they have to help the families. Me hunting pets. By the door, 20 past 6, the pets are flying. Phnom Penh has no infrastructure. The toilets, they run on the rivers. They're in the middle of the city. The rivers, they wash out the sewage into the lakes. That's where uh, water spinach and morning glory is growing. But these pets, they're very valuable. It's 15 cents one pet, but they're risking their lives every day. Every day they risk their life because this is like surge. When they dive in there, when they swallow this water, they lose conscious. We lose every week, every month, we lose several boys. And we cannot even find them in this dark kind of water. And five, six days later on, they drift up and we find them between the plastic. And that's the story of nearly every day's life in Phnom When I rode way over, I had contact to a hospital. Uh, it was a friend of mine, Dr. Chim, Children's Surgical Center. 800 to 1,000 children every day he has in front of his hospital. He has a very small operation theater. It's about 40 square meter, five operation chairs. The children, they walk in from the street. We put them on the operation desk. The operator has no actually preparation, nothing. This is the only way because Cambodia in the medical system, which just arrived in the 1960s. There's a lot of medications coming into Cambodia, but this is not for Cambodia. It's been sold on by all these corrupt people back to Vietnam, to Thailand, to China. We don't see nothing. But what happened in this hospital, they are horrifying pictures. This is a young girl who had plunged with acid who said her own. This is a baby. Baby makes the most money when they clutch them, you know, because everybody feels even more sorry. And this is a seven-year-old, a seventeen-year-old girl where they clutch the acid in her face. And that's how they look like when we try to fix them up. But it's a bit of a problem. You don't have the right medication. And when you see when it turns black, usually it's rotten away. And these people they die of the infections. Acid is used as punishment. If a girl falls in love with a guy, but the family wants her to uh, marry somebody else, but she does, she disagree. That's usually what she is ending up with acid in the face. And that's a horrifying story, but it's daily business. When I discovered all this, I said, Hannes, you have to be scared. You know, I, I took pictures and I said, I cannot just making pictures now there and, and, and know these people and now walking off, I go back home to my beautiful Switzerland, right? I started life support donations, you know. I started, like any other NGO, buying rice, 9,000 kilo a month, mineral water, because we had no water, 7,000, 8,000 liter, and up to 1,000 cans of milk powder. And it really went well, you know. The people were happy. I started to get clothes. I became a part of them. I took in charge of about nearly 380, 390 families. It varies a little bit. Some went, some came and go. But then after one year, buying all this rice and water and trying to help and, you know, little many boxes. And I said, Hannes, what do you do here? I mean, one year, 
But what have I changed? They haven't changed anything. They still live in that dirt. They still vulnerable to prostitution, child prostitution, slavery. And I felt so sorry for these children. I said, God, you know, I, I, I think this is not successful what I do. So I said, I have to take care of our children. I had over 280 children. I took them on. I was buying 280 pair of uh, school uniforms, rucksacks, books, pens. I had to buy 12 tuk-tuks to drive them from the dump site into the, not close to the city in the school. But I had to pay because we are one of the corruptest countries in the world. The teacher don't uh, give you any education if you don't pay. 25 cents for the little one, 75 cents for the big one, a dollar for the even bigger one, right? And uh, of course, I had also to pay the parents because now there was no blowjobs anymore. The kids could give. There was no recycling anymore. So there was another up to a dollar per child, right? But I was so happy. You know, I had all these children. You know, we tried to arrange, wash their clothes. You know, we tried to feed them. And I said, yes, 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 yes. You know, at least we're getting out. Even if it's only 300 or 400, at least we get them out of that shit. And after seven months, I was sitting down and said, Hannah's like, Getting close to 70. I mean, how, how many years can you support these children? How long do you support? 20 years? How long can 20 years? You know, they pay for your clothes, for your food, and, you know, for your kindergartens and whatever you need, for all you need. Me there, alone, right? Uh, bringing my money from Switzerland. And, and I said, this is even more stupid than what I did before, supporting children. It's one of the most stupid things I actually ever started. I said, but if I would support the parents. So I talked to the parents, where are you from? They said, oh, 60, 80 kilometers in the north or there and here. And I said, well, do you have land? They said, oh, we lost the land. The government in Hunsin has taken away or the Chinese has taken us the land away or the government, you know, the local government. And they said, okay, but you have auntie, uncles? Yeah, yeah, okay. I said, all right. I load them up on trucks. The families drove up 80, 100 kilometers and said, okay, let's start with agriculture. So I started to uh, fish farms, chicken farms, pigs, you know, like 1,000 chickens, so we make the fences, the little huts, and I said, yes, now these parents can make money, and when they make money, they can support their children, right? Well, the first three months, they were really great, and in the fourth month, from 1,000 chickens, I don't know, they were already dead, right? The fish were swimming upside down, they had like bacterial fungus infections. And the pigs couldn't walk anymore because genetically so destroyed that you needed, I mean, truckloads of antibiotics that they actually survived so that you had to find, you could kill them and sell them in. I said, how does this is even more? This is crazy. Like, what do I do? And when I was sending money from my bank in Switzerland, UBS, of course, UBS. <laughs> so, the Canadian bank in Cambodia, if I said $15,000, I only got ten. I said, no, look, sir, look, I mean, here, yeah, 15000 Swift, UBS, Swift. Oh, sorry, sir, we only have 10. Do you want the 10? No, you don't want the 10. So, Hun Sin practically one third of the money you ship as an individual or an international NGO is taken by the president. I or some other guy. So, if you then pay all the others, then maybe there's 40% left from your 100%. And I was complaining, I said, these bastards, you know, so on. Jim, my my friend in the meantime he said, Hannes, you have to be really clever, you have to become local. Because if you're local, they don't take your money because local has no money. I said, well, what do you have to do? I said, you have to become a local organization. So I was looking for a young lawyer, Lee, you know. Um, together we started signing in Cambodia. And uh, well, look here, you know, after four months, nobody took money from us anymore. And then I saw in the papers that I can own land as a local NGO. So I bought nine hectares of land. I said, let's start again. Let's do it better. So we started again, nine, nine hectares of land, 60 kilometers in the north. And I started there in May 2014, smiling in Cambodia. Right. OK, well, I had an idea. I said, well, what do we need? I, I also realized you know, I should not make it the life comfortable in the slums and on the way still, actually, these people are farmers. I have to try to bring them back to the country because they cannot read, they cannot write. They have no skills, they have no understanding. What do they do in the city? Nothing, they're vulnerable. But if I bring them back to the country and they become farmers again, maybe they can crack it, right? So what did I do? I took a piece of paper and said, all right, I bring the first 
uh, uh, families out there, 12 families, about 300 people. Right? I made a drawing and said, okay, 12 farms, each one 4,000 square meters. I have fish, I have chicken, and pig again, right? And then, because I'm in the area or on the flood area of the pond is up, I had to lift up my whole country by 90 centimeters, otherwise my fish were swimming to the chicken or the opposite. Well, no, not the opposite, they were probably there. Right? <laughs> so for this, I dig the lake, 23,000 cubic. I dig down the earth, so I filled up my land and in uh, June, 1st of June in 2014, I was in paradise. I had all these caterpillars and these trucks, and I was moving this earth that I was really paradise. You know, this is a boy's dream, right? Caterpillar. <laughs> so I started to plant everything. We took all the trees out, started to doing it. But then when the first rain came, you know, I saw, oh, I have not lifted up enough, so I had to. Uh, produced myself 780 meter of concrete pipe, so we put them in, so we collected the water part, November 2014. I don't know what that is. The first 300 people moved out to my farm. It was really very nice. I did not metal sheds, you know, I had wooden houses, old queer traditions, you know, they had a bathroom, we started again with agriculture, we started with chicken, we started with pigs again. I had fish that time, you know, so it was really going. The people were moving from the slums, from the uh, um, downside out to us, you know, and they couldn't believe how beautiful it is out there. And you see the pigs still wobbling around a little bit, they were actually not much better. And uh, well, the chicken looked better, but actually they were not really better, right? And the fish were dying, but it doesn't matter. I had them out of that environment, of that dirt. The kids were running around, playing on the fields. They were happy. They didn't, they didn't want to go home anymore. But I had the same problem. You know, my uh, uh, chicken was still dying. And, uh, well, the hens, maybe one egg, two eggs a week, you know. But I wanted to produce eggs, you know. And, 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 you know, fertile eggs. But it didn't work. The pigs had the same problem. And I was really devastated. So when I was back in Switzerland, I made an email at the Agriculture Institute, uh, 12 of them, I said, hey, I'm an artist, I'm in Cambodia, you know, I'm going to become a farmer, but I have no idea, please help. <laughs> well, one wrote back and said, hey, Mr. Schmidt, uh, agriculture is very, very technical today, and uh, you need to have a lot big and long knowledge, and blah, 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 blah. And then we had a coffee, and uh, he said, look, I, I cannot help you over a coffee. Uh, he said, you know what, I sent you two of my agriculture engineers, they come and have a look. So, two months later, they were down there, and uh, while well, it was devastating, you know, genetic of the chicken, zero, genetic of the pigs, zero, right? Actually, I had soy, but nothing would grow, I didn't know. I saw the soy, you just put something in, and then it grows, no, it just grow, right? It's all like this. Well, they said, Mr. Schmidt, five to seven years, till you can grow vegetables, and um, I need your genetics. I said, look, I don't have time, five cents a year, you know, I'm an old man, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm actually one of base. So we started really scientifically, we started with an agriculture school, right, we were very, very fast. Uh, today, 170 of hectares of land, 60 hectares of competent bio-organic uh, products uh, started an agriculture school for the farmers. We have over 300 farmers who are in our agriculture school. We teach them how to fertilize, how to water, the whole thing. And when you look from the air, this is our agriculture area today. Very, very fast, uh, 12, 18 tons of uh, eggplants, uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, you know, uh, everything goes very well. But it was a huge effort. Uh, we really jumped around every corner, uh, used uh, biomasses, uh, you know, tear the biomasses apart, using manure of the pigs, of everything, and tried really the latest technology to make this soil uh, so that we could grow. And you can see the cucumbers not very nice. They are bioorganic. And, uh, but this is also the problem. We are in the competition on the markets with the Vietnamese beautiful parrots. When you switch off the light, they glow. <laughs> <laughs>
right? And the community and they're not educated, they don't know that this is better for them to eat, so we have really problems where we have to solve to set our vegetables. But these are the tomatoes, the Thai tomatoes, 10 tons, 15 tons. We change every two, two and a half months, we change our products, what we grow, so we have a very fast uh, turnover to bring new nourishment. Uh, in uh, our fields and uh, now we're extending, extending and I believe in about maybe a year and a year and a half we're the largest producer of bio-organic vegetables in Cambodia. The story of my chickens, I tell you, I love them. <laughs> uh, well, one egg, two eggs a week, you need every day, day. I look at my little chickens, oh guys, I need every day. day. You know, well, you know, genetically they were not there, so we had to reinstate the genetics. It took us one half year. Today we have 25,000 hens in a fertility rate of over 90%. That means out of nearly every egg we produce the chicken, we, we hatch our own eggs, you know, very scientifically, and it's really fantastic. And I think the people who are there, we have the best eggs in the world. There's nothing better than our eggs. But even more proud, it's this, oh. you know. Because really my, yeah. my chicks are the best chicks. The best sport you can have, reinstated in two years the genetic. I was flying every month with spurs from Switzerland in my suitcase. Yeah. I was always worried, I was worried if I have a long lay over here in Singapore to Cambodia in 24 hours that they would take me out and put me in jail here. You know, when you fly with sperms in your suitcase. <laughs> but I tell you, the, 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 the mother's house that is so happy. <laughs> but it's not only that, we have a lot of other problems. Rice is disappearing. We're going to lose in the next 20 years nearly 40% of the rice production because the Chinese damped the Mekong 20 times. There is no flooding anymore, so there is no nourishment anymore. Today, already from about 7 to 8 tons per hectare, we're down on 1.4, 1.6, 1.8 tons. The farmers cannot exist. Of the rice field. So that's enforced even more that the young people have to move into the cities. And this is the disaster. At the end, there's only old people on the countryside. They cannot really work on their fields anymore. The rich people come, as soon as there is a road, they buy for little, little money, they buy these rice fields, but they don't produce rice, they put cows on it, and then these families have to take care for five dollars for three months about the cows, and the cows eat everything down to the roots, so this is erosion. So in about three, four years, nothing will grow anymore. It will be a desert with the heavy rains we have. I said, it is not possible. I built my own rice mill. That's just a project. We start now with our own rice mill. I have 18,000 hectares of rice. We try to improve the farmer's life. We start to regrow the rice. We try to find better kind of uh, seeds uh, for them. And uh, this is the rice mill. We will have about 20,000 people after one harvest who will have a new life and will have a better life just bringing the rice meal to the rice. The problem is we only have big rice meals in Vietnam and in Thailand, in Cambodia, but nearly not. But we do 30% of the rice production from the penny to the factory because the rice is still wet. They dry it on plastic on the street. It's infected by bacteria and by funguses, and that's how we lose world. Totally production, 30%. And I said, why don't we build the rice meal close to the rice fields so we don't lose the whole thing? So this is how the rice field looks like. But then fish, very important. I failed and I was holding a speech at the university in Zurich with the fish specialists. They are worldwide leading uh, in uh, kind of protein production. Fish is the most important source of protein in the future. Okay, in Europe they start to eat uh, insect burgers, right? But this is not the way to go because we need the insects to produce animal proteins to eat to feed the fish to feed the animals. So that's is the right way. And they said, well, you know, scientifically, I don't see a problem. This should actually work, you know. So they came and they looked at me, and we started at uh, beginning of this year. We started a huge uh, fish kind of project, and. Uh, We started with about 35,000 genetically clean fish and uh, now we're in full production, we're building huge lakes. It's going to be 200 tons by this end of the year, it's going to be 1 million kilo in 22, 21, 22. We fill in the fish, we export the part and the rest we keep in Cambodia and of the leftovers we produce fish sauce. 
And then he was like an objecto balsamico, you know, we did five years in a barrel and we sell it for $1,000 uh, per liter to the Japanese because they love these old sneaky souls, you know. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's like a good buy, you know, as older it gets, it's more expensive it gets, you know. So we have a lot of idea how we push up our markets and it really makes progress. It's very scientific, we have a lab there, we have scientific, we have uh, students, they do their master and their bachelor works with us, and this is the results you see in 21. And we can feed people with healthy fish by organic growing fish. In the village where I am, there is a school, 780 children and five teachers. And uh, this is how these children look like They're dirty, they have nothing to eat, uh, the teachers are very badly educated, they can't hardly read and write their own language. And I said, this is not on. I mean, we have to do something for the kids. So there was an old building from the French, French colonial style. I refurbished it. I were putting a roof back on again. We were doing tables and chairs, and we brought in books. And, uh, you know, we paid the teacher. We got some extra teacher. And I did immediately, I was building a mensa because I said, children have to eat three times a day because if they have no uh, proteins, if they don't have sugar, they cannot study. And today we have in the public school, we have about 800 kids who have three meals every day. And then I drilled 180 meter deep to build, uh, for drinking water because you have to drink very, very deep. If you only go 20, 30, 40 meter like all the NGOs do, your water is contaminated by arsen. It's arsenic. This is what happened here in Asia. You have a very high content of arsenic. And if you for five years drink arsenic water, you're not going to live long. And that also helps, actually, so that people only have this very uh, short span of life. Well, we have avoided 80% of all the bacterial infection just with washing hands with soap. That's all. No antibiotics, no nothing, just wash hands. And I tell you, these kids are really healthy today. You can see the vibrant, you know, they want to work, they want to study. They're very excited kids, very, very nice to see. But I know I have so many more children there, you know. I have, at the end, I need a primary. I, no, it's even worse. I need a nursery. I need a pre-kindergarten. I need a kindergarten. I need a primary, a secondary, a high school. And actually, at the end, I need a university. So I went to the university in Zurich. We have a specialist. It's about alternative construction and building material. Bamboo, bamboo fiber will exchange the steel in the concrete, and the concrete will be exchanged by mushroom bio-organic construction material. That means you can build your houses, these kind of buildings with mushrooms. Isn't that funny? Right. <laughs> you can eat the stuff at the same time you build it. You know, you make a nice mushroom soup. Really. So then I went there, met the professor. He said, oh, I have 34 students. You know, they have to do their diploma work. Are you happy when they're going to uh, you know, do the planning of your school? I said, you're welcome. So they came to Cambodia. And uh, eight months uh, all together, and they finished up with uh, 18 completely designed projects. Out of it, we were selecting the five best ones, and uh, it was five young female architects, and they designed our school, an amazing simple system. It's low tech, it's not high tech. But because we don't have this alternative material yet, we are having in a half a year, we're starting with the bamboo construction, we had the carpentry, because this is the problem. You know, nobody has a skill, there is no carpenter, there's no electric, there's no plumbers, you know, there's no engineers, no nothing. The people who study in Cambodia, they study in Khmer. Well, when you are studying in Khmer uh, agriculture, you've never been on a farm. If you study architect in Khmer, you've never been on a construction site. And they stopped with their education system in the 1960s. So when you are Coming out of university, you have learned in the 1960s from, from your knowledge, and this is a disaster. So I said, we have to give these young people a skill, you know, I mean, that's, that's what we need. Also here in Singapore, you need somebody to build your house, you know, renew your door, you fix your toilets, you know, so you need skilled people. So I said, okay, I made myself a drawing, what do I need for a carpentry? I have a friend who's a carpenter, he said, oh, you need this machine and this machine and this machine. Okay, so amazing, by 2016, I start building my carpentry. In August 2016, my carpentry was ready to go for rock and roll, and that's how my carpentry shop looks like. Today, it's a very modern, up to date, it's probably the best carpentry shop in, for sure, in Cambodia, maybe far over in Southeast Asia. 
But the problem was, I have no idea about coffee. <laughs> so I went to Biel, that's a, a city in Switzerland, uh, it's an university for wood engineering, so they have to study four years, so then I went to the rector and said, do you have any of these young guys? He said, yeah, they have to do one year practice after they finish their study. So they came to me, we started to uh, develop the curriculums, now we have a very large carpentry, because also this carpentry was already now building the parts, the wooden parts where we have for our school. This is all done in a short period of time. We have over 55 people working in the carpenter shop. It takes five to six years, our apprentices, they have to study. Why? Because when they come to us, they cannot read, they cannot write, they have no idea, they have never seen an angle, they don't even know what really different kind of wood is. So, but after five years, six years, they're going to be incredible, good, educated craftsmen, so we have a problem, there's no other carpentry shop in Hong Kong. Where do they go? Can you imagine in the past 20 years, four and a half thousand engineers, hundreds and thousands of millions of dollars, and we have not managed to make any kind of system. We still the poorest country in Asia, one of the poorest in the world. We still have no education system, and we still have actually no medical system. And you ask yourself, where is all this money going? It's crazy. The money is all gone. So I said, okay, we have to build an industrial education and training camp. That's what we're building up. That means we are going to train apprentices. Uh, it's a dual system. They go to school at the same time they work. And in the next five years, six years, we're building up a whole kind of a setup with small corporations where these young people, they can go and work. But I had all these plans for this school, and that was the day I had to start building because the rules and regulations in Cambodia is school starts on the 15th of November. So if the school is not ready by then, and you don't have the permit by the local government, you have to wait one year. Okay, so I started with my school, oops, sorry, July 2017, and I knew I had to be finished on the 15th of November. I moved 600,000 cubic of earth. Huge construction site. In Switzerland, it would be the third largest construction site, right? So we were in the carpentry, building all these frameworks, this amazing low-tech uh, architecture, right? And uh, we had Sika, a very uh, big company, they helped us with concrete, and we had very bad weather. We had the worst rainstorms last year, so we had a delay of over a month. Sometimes things we couldn't work, but we went on, we went on, I had over 400,000 people on my construction site, and I didn't give up early in the morning, till late at night, we were working. I had in Plenia a large uh, construction company who came with the coaches who teach these people how to build walls, how to do the brickwork, how to do everything, and we went on, and went on, and went on, and went on, and there was no break, there was no sleep, there was no nothing, and we managed see the construction site and we opened the school on the 15th of November last year. And this was the day I was crying. I still cry because I got these two buses and we were putting these little bus stops eight kilometers around us and we were picking up these children who had no idea where they go, right? And they didn't know what really happened to them. Now can you imagine they starting on the 15th of November. They go to a nine-year school program, 2027. They come out of ninth grade, and 2031 out of their 12th grade. They had no idea what's going on, right? And it is so, I mean, so important. It is such a pleasure when, you, when you're there and, and you know, you know where they're going. This is not a regular school. This is probably the best school in Asia. We have a double system, it's not even bilingual. We have Khmer on one side and English on the other side, right? We have Khmer teacher for Khmer and we have bilingual, we have European, American, Singaporean teacher on the English side, right? And from here after 9 and 12 years, you can go straight into a university. What's in our own university where we live in the meantime and in any other university of the world? This is an education system. Or has a future. And it's modern. We teach already IT in the first grade because it's not enough that you can handle an app in five, six years. You have to know how it's the function of an app and you should be able to build your own app. This is the future. And 
this is all integrated in the school. Sport, I have a girl football team, they meet the guys all the time. <laughs> it's very nice to see, it. it's so much pleasure. But then I had to make money somehow. And a lot of people, they say, oh, Hannes, can we stay with you? Can we come to you? I said, I have nothing, I have nothing. I mean, you can <coughs> sleep in a hut, you know? I said, hey, great idea, why don't I don't think the whole time. <laughs> so I took uh, five of these uh, Cambodian huts and, you know, made them a bit better and, well, no air conditioning, but the people were so happy. They said, hey, I can really make money, this can be my cash machine. So, but do I have an idea about the whole thing? No, no idea, right? So I went to the International Hotel Institute in Switzerland and they were sending me some guys and we started training my people, you know, and it went very, very, very quickly, you know. I mean, I believe today my people better train than anybody who works in a raffle hotel, or a <laughs> you know. And, uh, well, this is happening in South Come and see, come to us. We have yoga, we have massage, we have a five-star restaurant. It's paradise, the best pork you ever see. <laughs> right? Look at this, I've been in a swimming pool, why? Because I do yoga retreats, they only come if they can swim, right? Beautiful, uh, very good trained people, you know, look at our yoga shalas, 40 by 40 meters, right? If you stay there, you never want to go home, this is really paradise. <laughs> now we're building a really nice spa where you can do it. You don't want to look 10 years younger in two years. <laughs> Food. I have a barista, the best cappuccino, latte macchiato, espresso, <laughs> and we have an amazing area where you can go and meditate with the monks. Beautiful place, Madame Yankor Bansai. Right? Sunset, sunrise, you then you you sweep you not even touch to the floor. When you do home, you just go out. <laughs> It's not easy. My people come from the rice field. You know, it took us more than three months for my housekeeping to train the women to clean the toilet. They've never seen a toilet. they never seen a plastic truck to uh, uh, clean the toilet. But we also have over 50 people in our hotel team, and I was lucky. I'm a lucky guy. I always, like, I always meet the most beautiful woman. You know, 1972, I came to, go to, to Singapore the first time. And you know, that time, the most beautiful women in Asia that were in Singapore, you know, the cookie street, but unfortunately they were not women, they were all women. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Maria I met about four years ago, a young Cambodian, very tough, child prostitution, prostitution, forced marriage to an old man. Now in the 90s she got pregnant, right? The old man kicked her out, he didn't want to take care about the baby. She was forced to leave the child with the mother and go back into prostitution. Before, when she was a child, the mother sold her to a family, and the old man in that family wanted always to sexually abuse her. So she was running away, and the mother had to pay back the money. So Maria had to work in the factory for really no money. A horrible, horrible life. And my took to five was so soapy is my half from me. He came to me and said, look, I have this woman, she's somehow a far out relative of us, can you help her? So we took her in, she had a baby, we put the baby in kindergarten, in the nursery, and Maria, we sent me to an English school, right? And after half a year, she still was not able to speak English. And I said, why? Why can't you speak English? Okay, I knew she cannot read and write her own language. So I called the teachers and I realized they don't speak English either. You know, it's no wonder she comes and speaks English. And I discovered that she has an amazing talent. She was cooking. She was cooking in our office. And it was so good for food. It was so different. And then I had visitors from Switzerland, from the Hotel Institute, uh, the CEO, and he was eating with me. He said, oh, what, what do I eat here? This is, this is not Vietnamese. This is not Thai. This is like, I never tasted anything. This is so, so, so beautiful. I go to the kitchen, Maria's cooking. Yeah. So he went there, came back and said, oh, I come back the next day, she's cooking again. 
Next day he came to me and said, Hans, this woman is a talent. I've never discovered, discovered such a young person who can cook like this. And I said, well, if you're telling me she is a talent, then I bring her to Switzerland, I make a passport. He said, no, you cannot do that because she cannot read and write. He said, no, but she can cook in Switzerland. They can't cook, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, two months later, she was in Switzerland for two months, right? Uh, amazing. They couldn't believe. Then back to Cambodia, back to Switzerland, then back again, Cambodia, back to Switzerland. And she stayed with Annegret Schlumpf. She's a five star chef, you know, for two and a half months. And she got really trained. And then I took her to Crissier, to Frank Giovannini, three Michelin stars, 19, going mio points, you know. And he first was kind of a bit, mm. I said, What do I do with this Cambodian girl? I said, No, just let her cook. Well, after one week, he said, I'm not giving it back to you. I think her is fantastic. Then she went back again to another chef. Then she went to Massimo, to Modena, number one in the world today. Massimo wanted to keep her. And this story went on and on and on. And this little Maria out of Cambodia is rising up like the star uh, into heaven. And she creates and creates and creates. JD Hotel in Andermatt, one of the most famous hotels in the world, has taken over her dishes and she cooks with the big chefs. And when you come to us, you will taste her food. The best cook of that in the world. Look, our chickens are so tough, you really can't eat them. You know, they're wild chickens. So you can cook the cook of an eight hour and then it's really tender. It's like a ayam kampo, you know, like this, uh, this, this wild animal. But she produces ice cream out of pepper. And it's amazing the talent she has. And it's amazing she's taken in as the 21 chef of Frank Giovannini, one of the world's best chefs. And it shows, even if you can't really read and write, if you cannot even count, actually, only since one month, she knows that there is 1,000 gram in a kilo. <laughs> it's not a joke. It's not a joke. It's amazing. And now she complains because her uh, sous chefs still don't know that there is 1,000 gram in a kilo. So, you know, she made such a big progress, and now she is teaching them, and she... Now she has the same problem. She says, I don't understand. Why don't they understand? I understand now. <laughs> you know, it's very crazy. But, uh, yeah, she... Now we have a lot of uh, relations to the big chefs. They come, they send their talents. We have a lot of exchange. And we just been awarded with the Golden Palm of the ITB. So this is the highest award you can get for a hotel in the world. And I'm very proud of that. But from nine hectares, today 170 hectares, it's growing, it's growing fast because also we have no time to waste. These people, we need to educate them. We need them for us to educate. I will explain. These are the system of NGOs. They're all one-way streets. One does a little bit of school, one a little bit water, one a little bit chicken, and the other one does a little bit of here, but nothing is holistic. When I started, you know, I'm an old guy, but I understand we're living in the age of the clouds. You know better than me. So I said, Smiling Gate was the cent center. Me. I built a cloud around me. This was 2015. 2016, in the cloud, I could extend, right? I had suddenly, I had my livestock breeding, agriculture, crafts, carpentry, this farmhouse, you know, with tour guide, cook service. You know, I could play, employ, employ people, teach, teach, teach. I brought on the coaches from Europe. Smiling Echo is run by Cambodians only. I'm the only, and I'm just an advisor on the advisory board, because I said, Cambodians have to work for Cambodia. 90% of all the NGOs are run by expats and foreigners. Why is that? Well, because if they teach the locals, they're not needed anymore one day. And then they lose their job. They don't want that. So they do not empower the people. They keep their position to run. And I said, an NGO has to do much more than just empower the single person or make a better well-being. We have to generate an economical growth. That was my idea. In 2018 now, we have proven that over 7,000, 8,000 people living from us, by the end of, um, say, mid-19, mid it arrives with 25 to 30,000 people living from us. So we're generating an economical growth. This is so important. And if you don't do that, we're ending up like we did for the last past 20 years. We're spending thousands of millions, and I think it's going to move. This is 2020. This is 25. But I suddenly had an idea that I want to be the first smart village in the world. Everybody talks about smart cities. Well, Singapore, you can make smart. That's possible. 
But if you think Phnom Penh, if you want a smart Phnom Penh, you have to evacuate 1.6 million people. Then you have to flatten down everything, tear everything down because it's everything built on shit, I'm sorry to say. And you have to rebuild the city, nobody has the money. But on the countryside, held by 10 kilometers, you make a cross with two roads here, you do agriculture, education, little things and little this, and you can bring the smartest village in the world without investing thousands of billions. I think this is what we want to achieve. To do that, in 2025, that is the first smart village. In 2030, we have been in Cambodia seven of the smart villages, and in 35, 17. And you would not believe this calculation is done by PricewaterhouseCoopers. We're just at the moment producing a called a white paper. By 2035 to 50, we produce 30% of the GDP of Cambodia. We are oil, we are gas, we are looting the forest just by exchanging imports to domestic production and export in agriculture. Well, I come slowly to the end, but I want that Wei can speak to you. Wei today, she went, when I brought her uh, five years ago, primary school, secondary school, high school, she rushed to all this. She's at the university today. She's one of the most brilliant young women I ever met in my life. I brought her to the UN. She was telling the story at the UN. And a couple, well, it was now nearly, nearly a year ago, I went back with her the first time to her family, her father. And it was very sad. The father didn't know where to look, he didn't know where to go. She went straight to him. She put, put him in her arms and said, you know, I think, I think you never wanted it. But I think it must have been an accident. I think I don't believe the story anymore. You didn't want it to do it. And then you meant it very well because you wanted to give me away to this old woman who I know somebody told me wanted me to sell flour. But then it came all different. You know, this woman had the most horrible life of any years you can imagine. Prostitution, sold, beaten up, put in jail, you know, spent in jail, give blowjobs in jail to the police in Thailand. A hell and she tells the story, the story how uh, Cambodians deal with their history. You know, if you talk to Cambodian, actually the Red Khmer has never really happened. They don't want to talk about it. No, oh, it was a good time. Today it's much better because the president, you know, is electing himself on the 28th of this month. And uh, he comes on TV every day and he says, well, guys, if you don't elect me, if you don't vote for me, Pol Pot is coming back. And then you're going to have the miserable life that you have. At the moment, it's the best time to buy land from the farmers. They sell 20, 30, 40% of their land because they're so scared about this election. They said, well, if you have cash, we can run. If you have land, we cannot run. And this is crazy. But way, one of the most brave, the most incredible woman in my life. Can you bring it up a bit? Hello, my name is Katrin Well. I'm 18 years old. I come from Cambodia. I was born in Battambang province. When I was a small child, an accident happened and my face and my body was badly burned. I can't remember exactly, but I know it was very painful for me. I remember after a while, my parents gave me away to an old woman who wanted me to sell a flower. The old woman brought me to Thailand and sold me to a begging certification when I was three years old. From that on, I was begging on the street, the market, and on the bridge. My day was very long. I had to start early in the morning till it was late at night. When I was four years old, I was back in Pattaya. I was lucky when foreigners saw me and made more money. At the end of the day, I had to give my money to the banking certification. The burn in my face, it was very bad. I 
was burned on one eye. To the burn of my mouth, my lips were sealed and I had difficult to eat. In all the four years, I was back here in Thailand. I had no medical help or educational support. In 2004, the police was arresting me and put me in jail. They had no legal paper and I'm not from Thailand. I was Cambodian and I had no passport. Nowadays, I am very happy with my life. I can go to study like everyone. I can study English, computer, dancing. Also, you know, myself, I can sing very well. I like singing and dancing. I have many of friends. They really like me. Also, I love them too. We, we are so close. What I'm thinking is I have a good life, good friend, like everyone. I want to study politics and environment. That's why I, have, I want to change our countries. Well, because we, Maria, thousands of children and family, that's why I'm there. And I want to make a change. I want to change. And uh, we need the help of everybody to change this world. I think we're on the better end than the other one on the other end. But if you look where the future is going, uh, in uh, 1945, Europe, America is only 20% of the world's population. Of course, economical growth is in Asia. But this is not just a luxury, because if you're not changing the situation of these many hundreds of millions of people, you end up estimate that if we not really quickly changing the education system, the skill system, by 2040, 2045, we will have up between 2.5 and 3 billion people who have no education, no skill, cannot work, cannot make money, and cannot contribute to the economical growth. And that would be for our children and for their children would be a disaster by then. So we have to change that. And change we can bring, philanthropy can only work in the connection of economy and only something who leads to profitability can be a system. You guys all maybe have a job, but if your employee or your company is not making money anymore, you lose your job. And why should that be different in the NGO world? It's not different. That's what we have to change. So please help us. It doesn't matter. You don't need to especially to support us, but think about it. Only give you money there where it leads to economical growth and where it leads to a really a kind of a system in education. But still the best place in the world is on our farm. <laughs> it's great. It's an amazing experience. And I think probably can tell, uh, can prove it's an amazing experience, the best food. For everybody who wants to go to a beautiful spa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Some way that we can help, and it's not just about donating money. I think that's we have pilots, we have uh, we have a judge in the room, we have Olympic swimmer in the room. You know, this everyone has a way that they actually contribute, and I think uh, you can see, Hannes is not a hotel, you know, he's not a farmer, but with the passion, with the support, with the connections from everyone, I think we can all make the world a better place. So once again, please put your hands together. But then perhaps we could just spend five minutes for some questions, and if uh, after the five minutes, I think Hannes will still be around for some casual uh, Q and A. Uh, does anyone want to just ask some questions for Hannes for benefit of everyone? Thank you. 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 Thank you
So, uh, Nini is from uh, Manado, Indonesia, and she runs a fish factory, a family business, and she wants to bring uh, sustainable fishing to the world. So, but she also likes to give back, and she wants to know how can she help in the next one year. Or okay, something very again. simple. Uh, end of September, uh, we do uh, very special. I, I run my own economy for her because I'm tired of the boats. You know, world economy forum. <laughs> they all talk, talk, talk. You know, they say, oh, this exploded world, but nobody has anything to put it together, right? And I said, well, the boss is fine. They all spend, you know, Black Croc and all these guys, they spend billions up there, but actually nothing more. So I do my own. So I started uh, this year the first time. It's uh, Liechtenstein Dialogue for Development, and I'm talking about uh, social impact investment and corporate social responsibility. So, Whenever you guys, on end of September, we do a very special event in Zermatt. Uh, we call it the Millennium Event. So all the young entrepreneurs, the people, and people also from rich or even poor families, it doesn't matter, they come to Zermatt with us. We spend three days hiking in the mountains, cooking our own spaghetti, and tick our hats together. Why? I realized the people who are deciding how this world is look like in the future, they are these guys in my age, right? They have the power to turn the switch, but they don't turn it the right way. It is your future. It's your world. And you have to take it in your hand. And we need exactly people like you, young person like you, who say, hey, we are the leader of the next generation. We can change that. And this is what we want to discuss. And then what we learn in there, we're going to bring it to the economy forums and we change these older guys, you know, who are still turning their switch in the wrong direction. This is what you can do. Join us uh, in Zermatt, or come to us, help us. Just, you know, we are in fish. If you are in fish, hey, this is fantastic. Sustainable fish, organic fish, you know, what can we do? Fish is the most important thing in the future. So this will be brilliant, you know, come. We can exchange, we have uh, fantastic people, scientists with us, you know, we can exchange our know how. We're not keeping this for us. We want to spread it out. We want to share. We can learn from you. You can learn from us. You know, but also we need IT people, we need nurses, hospital, you know, anybody who has a skill. But please come, join us, help us. We have to really kind of move something up. Even, you know, I, I, I go 1946, right? I don't know, the time of rock and roll, I traveled with more than 250 rock bands around the world as their photographer, 77. This was a revolution. You know, in Europe, we went through the music against our conservative parents. We had long hair, we had leather jackets, you know. But we don't even have pop that time, you know. We were, but we went up crazy in the music, you know, and our parents would not understand what we do. But this was a revolution. ACDC was it called, you know, all the heavy metal, hard rock, and the punk came. And we were fighting for our own existence because we didn't want it. To go on. Everybody has to do their own mistake. You, you generation, you have to do your own mistake. Don't listen to what the parents tell you. Make your own experience. Make your own mistake. This is important. And that's what I want to empower. And you can do amazing things just when you believe in it. You know, you need the energy. I'm 72 years old. Look at me. I really <laughs> crack myself on energy every day, you know, because it's so exciting. It's so exciting to do. So please, whatever have. Yeah. Everybody talks to you, and then you all come to us, right? And then we have a good time. We have also a lot of fun. It's important. We have to enjoy what we do. But it's also a serious business at the other hand. So please, please, I need you with your fish experience. <laughs> you said people like uh, for yoga instructors and uh, baristas as well, you know, uh, talking about better baristas, they're here today as well, the founders. Yeah. Yeah, we need, we have yoga retreat. It's beautiful. You know, we have diets, you know, we love the yoga guys, they only eat twice a day. They get up in the morning and then they march it. But the food, you know, funny things I can't do with because, you know. But it's a great place, it's peaceful, you know. The yoga shell is directed in the sunrise, sunset, beautiful. We're looking for people who do like retreats, who come like for four days, five days, you know, you come with your crew, you stay with us, we host you.
It's very beautiful. This is what we you can support us with our own then. And then you never get closer to the conversions than when you live with us, right? But if you have people with knowledge, technical knowledge, everything, you can use everything, right? So come. The problem is a bit the school many parts of education. We're looking very much for teachers at the moment. English speaking teachers, Singapore English speaking teachers. The problem is with children, we cannot take like one month's volunteering or three months because we learn that if the children are understand you, if you understand the children, so we're looking for teachers for one year. And it's, you don't have to do it for free, you know, we pay 60 minutes an hour, it's a very high pay. There's no, uh, no, no uh, points for flights. No, but uh, no, we, of course we pay and we are fair in there. This is a very nice place. We're looking for teachers, kindergarten teachers, teachers. Uh, very important for us. Uh, anybody who has to connection to uh, midwives, you know, we have to help this woman out there. One of the biggest problems is when these young girls in the factories when they have their first period, there is no OB, there is no hygienic mind. It's a horrible situation. They take the fiber of the coconut and they try to stuff it between their legs. And you can imagine uh, the blood is running down their legs in the factory and then you have like 13,000 women in the factory and 200 have a period. You cannot imagine the smell in there. And this is the first time when this suppression they birthday, that's the end of freedom in Cambodia, you know. Uh, they hide, uh, you know, they're shameful, uh, you know, and that's where the whole story of this very strong suppression of women start. So all when you have all, whatever you can imagine, you know, please uh, be very open and open, very nice. The best is you come once, you have a look, and then you can see what you do. Don't give up, just go for it. When it breaks down, start again. When it breaks down, start again. You know, like stand up, you know, it's like yo yo. That's the only way. Just don't give up. And that's the challenge. You know, I'm an artist. What I do there is social art. You know, I'm not an economist. I'm not coming from, I have no idea about the economy or finances. I'm an artist, and that's the way I think. I always, people have to understand what is the difference between an artist and a common person. We take the liberty to think free. We are creative. Thinking free, pair with creativity leads to innovation. And that's a very important thing, you know. Always try to think free. Think out of the box. Right? And that actually brings you a creativity. Okay, I think we'll end here and then we'll, we'll still be around for some time. But please put your hands together again and thank you.